and look at this beautiful, beautiful morning. Beautiful surrounding here and it's gorgeous. Um, you know, welcome, my name is Deacon John Taff and welcome here to our beautiful centre, uh, the Oasis Peace Centre and we're part of a new community that we have set up here that I've set up at the start of, of COVID a year and a half ago called we're the Apostles of Love Ireland and this centre, the Oasis of Peace Centre which is providential God has given and God has provided everything for it and it's a centre for prayer, teaching and healing I was born in, in Dublin and I was born, I suppose, into a family, my, my a dad, mam and two sisters. I was baptised, made my first communion and confirmation, but outside of that there was no prayer, there was no faith and belief, there was no talking or getting to know Jesus, there was no practising of faith. You know, so in my life growing up, you know, I lived in a house where my dad was a drinker, had a very severe alcohol problem. You know, and my mother worked so much to try to provide for myself and my two sisters. And you know, when you grow up in a house like that, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of wounds, there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of anger. And I suppose I would have grew up with that um, from my early years. I remember making a decision at you know 12 years of age, making a decision that I just hated my father. You know, and it's not a nice word to use, but that's the way I was. I, I made a decision that I would never speak to my father again, never. During my growing up years and my early life and teenage life was money, materialism, success so I put all my energy into that area of being the best I could at everything I did I brought a lot of hurt upon my family uh, my sisters you know hurt by the way I behaved and then I went away at a very young age I even went on holidays and I came back and I, I went away and I came back and at 15 years of age I started to work in a in a golf club and I became a manager of that golf club at 17 and then I went into sales and sales and marketing and studied. I went on to become a sales rep and a sales manager and a sales director. I opened up my own company manufacturing, labelling and packaging and that led me on to, I suppose, be very comfortable in life. I thought I had everything. I thought I had, I had money, I had all the materialist things that I had in life and I thought that I was so happy. I married Joan when I was 23. Uh, I'd met Joan when I was 17 and we have uh, Joan, a beautiful beautiful wife, I don't know how she ever put up with me because um, I would have headed off on a Monday and came back on a Friday. We had three children, we have Amy and then I have two boys, 27 and 17. In their early years I wasn't around for my children. I wasn't around to show them maybe the love that I should have. Um, I maybe overlooked them their faith. They didn't have any understanding of their faith because how how could I bring anything of faith to them when I didn't have any understanding of faith? I suppose household, I, I kind of became so caught up in the world, in worldly things, in work, that other things took a back line. And when you don't have any relationship uh, or prayer in your family, how are you meant to get to know God? Who is this God? And in my life, people, you know, it was far from my life God was because my, my life was everything else barred off. Although I didn't speak to my dad at 12 years of age, 
you know, I thought that I could get back at him, um, that this could be a way of hurting him by me not speaking to him. But, you know, I, I look back and I think at that time, my dad, I suppose, the drinking that he was doing was covering up a lot of his own hurts. My dad was a very broken man. And so many times, I mean, people carry them brokenness from their own childhood. Um, and I suppose I look back and he didn't, my dad didn't know how to love. He didn't know how to share, he didn't know how to encourage, he didn't know how to be there. And so in some way his reaction towards me was like, just maybe he used to say it to ma'am, but because my mother was so angry with him, uh, it probably would never have came up. He would have just carried on. Uh, he, he, did he try speaking to me? He had a very, his heart was so hardened that nearly, um, it never came up. And at any time that something might have, he might have made an attempt to speak to me, it would have been just out of anger or getting on to me over something or, or trying to correct me or discipline me or something in some ways. You know, so that, there was that part from my dad. So there was, there was no real, I didn't notice him kind of trying to make the conversations or make a relationship with me. Uh, so, you know, so much from our own childhood we can carry on, we can bring into our adult life. And in my teenage years, um, you know, I was so wounded, so broken, um, so full of anger. Uh, all these feelings that I just pushed down, I'm trying to hide because out of shame, out of shame, you don't want neighbours to know, you don't want other people to know. But the one thing I kind of really felt was that in myself that, I'm not going to let people do this for me as I grow into adult years and I became hardened myself um, as I grew through them teenage years. I remember in 1997, going away for a weekend, socially, myself and Joan and, and friends, going away drinking the west of Ireland, beautiful place. And I suppose like so many of these weekends, you think, okay, you're going to drink and you're going to have meals and going to just, you know, have a laugh and, and have fun. But then, this one's very different. This is, this is the time when things changed in my life. In some way it started and, and you know, I think on that weekend, one of the girls that was with us, she said to me, she asked me, can I, could she give me a lift? Could I give her a lift up to give the key, a key to her mam? And I said, of course, I'll give you a lift up. And as I was driving up in the car with her, she said to me, John, do you believe in God? You know, do you believe in God? And I said, no, I don't believe in God. Actually, what I did, I, I you know, I, I blast, I, I blast God, that's famous in English girls, because I turned around and said, you know, I, I, I said, if I went into a church, I said he'd probably fall off the cross with shock, um, because I hadn't been in a church for all them years, um, since my kind of confirmation years. And she said, my mother says, and I always remember this girl saying, uh, first of all, this girl really wasn't in her faith, but she actually, you know, she said, John, what about confession? Do you believe in confession? And then I said, I haven't been at confession. I don't really believe in confession. And she said, my mother says that, you know, if you're, although your sins might be as red as scarlet, your soul, that after confession, it's as white as snow. And she said, I'm going to go to confession while I'm up here with my mom. There's confession happening. Would you come? You know, I did go. I did go. Um, it didn't mean anything to me. I used the same type of sins that I used when I was a, a child, you know, but when I came out of that confessional, I just, something felt different. This is probably the part of, of my life that changed. As the priest prayed, um, I seen in my heart and I seen in my whole being so many of the wrongs that I had done in my life, the hurts that I had done, the sins I had committed, uh, you know, all those years previously and the sins I was committing, did I even realize the sins I was committing? Um, I didn't know what was going on in me this, this day, but there's one thing that did come, this beautiful feeling of warmth, of peace, of joy, of love, touched me and I didn't know what it was. And I cried, 
and I cried all the way back from the, the west of Ireland. It took three hours and I cried so much. Never cried like that in my life. Um, the whole night I cried and reflected. And the next day I woke up and this piece was still there, but I didn't know what, and I wanted to hold on to it. I wanted to hold on to it because for the first time in my life, I knew that what I felt was different than what I always thought I had. Where I talked about with the money I had and success and materialism, I thought I had everything, but this was different. This was a different feeling and the most beautiful feeling that I ever had. And I knocked up, at the, I went to the parochial house, which I had never been, I never knew the priest in any way. And I said, Father, this happened to me yesterday. This feeling I have, how can I hold on to it? And the priest said to me, he said, John, you know, yesterday, what I think happened to you was that the Holy Spirit, you know, came alive in your heart. You were baptized and the Holy Spirit that was in, within you came alive. And you, you, you were touched that God poured out his love, his graces, everything upon you into your heart. And that's the feeling you're having. And I said, Father, but how can I hold on to this? How, how can I hold on to this beautiful feeling? And I said, I don't. He said, John, do you pray? And I said, I don't pray. I haven't prayed. I don't know how to pray because prayer never happened in my home. You know, he said, do you ever talk to God? I said, I don't know God. And he said, well, if you wanted to get to know a friend, how would you get to know a friend? And I said, I'd ask him questions and talk to him. He said, I want you to start doing that. He said, go over to the church, sit in the church, sit in the church and just start talking to God like you would talk to someone you wanted to get to know. And I went over to the church and I sat there and, you know, there was a little book. There's a little book sitting, sitting on, on a table and the book on the front of the book it said, it said, the fruit of silence brings prayer. The fruit of prayer brings faith. The fruit of faith brings love. The fruit of love brings service and the fruit of service brings peace. And I looked at this and this, you know, it was about Mother, Saint Mother Teresa, it was about, and it touched my heart because I'm saying I seen the peace and I said, I want to hold on to this peace. For me, you know, prayer was a conversation with God, was telling him everything I was going through, was offering things to him and asking him, asking him in any way, could he help me? Um, could he keep that peace within me? I, I seen it happening gradual. The Lord can work instantly, and I know he can work instantly, but that process of healing within my own life took time, took time. And the one thing was, I prayed, I prayed for my dad. I prayed every day for my dad, every day. Um, for two years, I prayed for him. And I also prayed for myself because I was told, I was told that I needed to pray for a gift of love and a gift of forgiveness. And the more I was praying, the more love that was growing in my heart. And, you know, two years later, my dad rang me and he said to me, you know, that place you go to where a lady appears, could I go? And he said to me, you know, he said, I don't want to go to any of that church or mass or any of that type of confessions. I don't want any of that. I just want to go for the sun. And you know, he did go for the sun. And I'll tell you why, because at that day, that first day he arrived, we went up the hill together and I prayed and I was praying for Our Lady to touch his heart. And um, the Lord touched his heart on, on, while he was on pilgrimage. And um, I was crying because in some way, I, during that time, our blessed, our blessed Mother, I said, please, Our Blessed Mother, touch my heart as well. Um, my mother had passed away five years previous. She died. And uh, I had, I'm not one for images of things, but my mother, I could see my mother and one line came out saying, John, I'm so happy your dad is here. Tell him that Jesus forgives him and I forgive him. And I started crying and I walked down this hill, this apparition hill, and I went back to where I was staying. And I realized I left my dad on the hill. Um, and hours passed 
and after three hours, there was a knock on the door. I opened the door. I opened the door and my dad was glowing. Um, I said, what happened to you? He said, well, you went off and left me. And he said, I followed the steeples. And he said, along that, I was looking for to find out where I was staying. And there was all these boxes at the side. And he said, I went along and he said, there was one priest and he, it said English outside. And he said, I'll ask him directions. And he said, he went in. And he said, John, I told him everything. I told him all the hurts, the pains, everything I had caused. And he said, you know what he told me? He told me that Jesus forgives me and your mother forgives me. I remember going, it was the first time that the diaconate, being deacons, they were bringing them into Ireland as regards ordaining um, married men as the permanent deacons. Uh, and I suppose in some way, Joan, my wife, had an issue. She kind of saying, oh, I hope this doesn't take away from priesthood. And I could understand her fear because people, I suppose, we didn't, we had a lot of ignorance, but we know that the diaconate goes back to the Acts of the Apostles. It was there in the early church. And, you know, for, for deacons to be able to be part of the church of service, service to the poor, part of working on the altar and doing the sacraments of, of baptism and helping out with weddings and funerals, all these different parts, the three parts of the diaconate ministry. Now, welcome. Uh, this is, we're just coming to our centre here. And this centre that was given to us by God took 12 years. 12 years, God put it on our hearts 12 years ago, but it's a place the Oasis Peace Centre is a centre of prayer, healing and pastoral care and support of others. One of my favourite saints, you know, that I, I use here, and this is the first class relic of St. Peregrine. And St. Peregrine is the patron saint of cancers and tumours. We also have, we have huge devotion to the Rosary and the Divine Mercy, uh, which we have this beautiful painting of the Divine Mercy that was hand painted in Krakow in Poland. And we have, you know, we see the power, the power of Jesus uh, through, through the, uh, you know, I suppose the chaplet. Uh, great mercies happen. You know, I know this is just a part of our area and we thank Our Lady of Knock. Um, you know, one of the greatest apparitions that we have in the world where Our Lady appeared and she said, but no words were spoken, but yet, you know, okay, we know the power of the rosary. In my hand, I know I spoke earlier of my dad. And my dad, you know, my dad died two years ago. But my dad, to me, this is his rosary beads. And he prayed on these rosary beads. He prayed the rosary so many times every day. Our Lady says, the rosary is the greatest weapon and it can stop wars. You know, the war that was in my life growing up, it stopped. It stopped the war in my life. It can stop the wars in the world today. If we come back and pray the rosary, even in our own vocation and knowing what God wants for us, ask, ask him to our lady in the rosary. If we're willing to give our lives to God, if we're willing to say yes to whatever he's calling us to, every day will be grace filled. And every day is grace filled. You know, and I know I'll go on and talk to you, you know, just in, in, shortly now, maybe about what's happened in my life through my vocation. But that's just the lead up to my, vo my vocation. But you know, the joy, the love, the mercy, the, you know, the compassion that God has put in my heart, that he has healed and continues to heal every day my life. Uh, and I just look forward to every day. You know what? The years that the locust robbed, he can give back. And I just thank you, Jesus, for that. Come back to me with all your heart. Don't let fear keep us apart. Long have I waited for your coming home to me and living deeply our new life. That says a lot to me. Because, you know, God is waiting for each one of us to come back to him with all our hearts. 
you know, and to think of the new life that we get through him. And he's calling each one of us to different vocations. And maybe for you watching this, he's calling you. Are you listening to his call? Because that song, that hymn, just reminds me of all of us. And here, you know, it's because just to come back to him. He's waiting for us with his arms open that he opened on the cross for all of us. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe getting you can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back towards God. Rise up. <laughs>